Hello and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast number 1740, the topic is Q&A and the title is Why I Change Equipment in the Gym. So what in the world am I doing? <laughs> I had a member ask me, now we just brought in a hack squat uh, like a day or two ago and they said, hey, didn't we used to have a hack squat? And I said, yes, we did. And they, I could tell on their face, their their follow-up question they weren't saying was, why did you buy it again? <laughs> or like, hey, if you got rid of it, why do we have it now? Um, so I thought it would be fun to answer that question in a podcast and just talk about, in general, like why I make changes in our gym. Now, this could be, hopefully, just if you're not a member of the gym, it's just fun to hear. I don't know, hopefully. <laughs> but... Uh, from a gym owner's perspective, why do why do I change things quite often? And recently we ran into a unique issue. And it's not, I guess, not really an issue, but a unique opportunity. That would be a good way of saying it. So as I've been growing the gym, I started the gym in 2011. I bought equipment that I knew was heavy duty and what felt good. I didn't care if it was the shiniest thing, if it was all the same color. I didn't care what company made it. If it felt well, like felt good, and it moved well, then that's what I wanted. What led to was a lot of older pieces. A lot of the older companies like Nebula, Flex Leverage, uh, a couple of companies like that, um, they make exceptional equipment. Exceptional. Uh, but for one reason or another, the company goes out of business. So those pieces become... It's kind of interesting. You have a collect of collective group of people who don't know the value of the equipment. If it's not pretty and shiny, they think it's old and worthless, so they'll sell it for pennies. And then you have people who do know equipment, and they're like, holy crap, you know, how did you get that? That's a super rare collective piece, and they understand how smooth and how good it feels. And they're like, ah, oh, just crazy good. So I was able to collect some of those really good pieces. I had a Nebula Hack Squat, Nebula Leg Press, uh, Flex Leverage Lat Pull Down, Flex Leverage Tricep Dip. We had a Flex Leverage uh, Seated Hamstring Curl, the Ham Tractor. We had a lot of really good stuff. Now, what was interesting was the patent on those designs ran out. And companies were starting to copy those designs. So if you have like a Strive, like we had a Strive bicep curl, uh, which allowed you to load different parts of the range of motion, well, Prime Fitness now has that capability. There's Arsenal. Arsenal Strength is copying the Nebula Leg Press. Actually, Rogue copied the Nebula Leg Press as well. So the designs were starting to be copied. So the market for those collective pieces, I was afraid was going to kind of drop out pretty soon people wouldn't want to pay a premium price for an older piece when they can get a newer piece that has the exact same metal strength the exact same design uh at the same price so why would you not buy a brand new one instead of one that's 20 years old so i was talking with my wife and i was like i think it's time for us to cash in on some of these older pieces and be able to upgrade the gym, be able to do some more upkeep costs and, you know, various things that that money would allow. So, for example, I was able to purchase the Nebula Hack Squat back in 2011 for $1,500 and I sold it for $7,000. I was able to get the Nebula Leg Press I bought for $2,000. I was able to sell it for $5,000. The lat pull down I bought for four hundred dollars. I was able to sell for four thousand. The seated hamstring curl I bought for six hundred dollars. I was able to sell for four thousand. So you can hear these prices are pretty extreme. Like you're getting, you know, the one piece I got a thousand percent markup from four hundred dollars to four thousand. So I was able to sell quite a few of the pieces to get more money brought into the gym, which I've been kind of trickling in with different ways and I'm saving some of it to try to get more like unicorn pieces so to speak so I haven't kind of fulfilled what I wanted to do with that extra money yet but that was one reason as to why members would have seen me starting to change some of the equipment in the gym so it's an awesome opportunity that 
back when I was able to get those pieces, and this was actually before Craigslist, how weird is that to say, uh, before Craigslist, it was before, um, like, actual used equipment companies had locations and big warehouses and stuff, like, I was basically scouring, um, well, actually, it was through Craigslist, it was before fa uh, Facebook Marketplace, so it was through Craigslist that I would find these ads, and then I would go drive and go get them, <laughs> you know, thankfully, the Hack Squad and Lake Press for Nebula was up in Charlotte, the lap pull down, I forget where it was, somewhere down in Georgia, uh, the Seat of Hampshire and Curl, I think, was also down in Georgia. I've gone up to Washington, D.C. for some pieces, and I live near Charlotte, uh, just for reference. So I've driven quite a few different crazy ways um, and had a lot of people help me, so thank you to everybody. Uh, but it was really cool to be able to get an influx of money to start to be able to upgrade and make some changes to the gym. So the gym's 12 years in now, so it's nice to have the gym continue to evolve uh, and continue to bring in newer pieces. One of the newer pieces we brought in was at the Rogue Bilateral Leg Press. So it's the exact same design as the Nebula. So I sold the Nebula Leg Press for five grand and was able to get the Rogue brand new leg press uh, for I think like 6500 So I only paid basically $1,500 for a brand new leg press. Pretty badass. Now the nice part of the bilateral leg press is you can detach the platform so each leg actually moves independent so you're getting unilateral work at the exact same time that you would typically do leg press so rather than having to add in extra unilateral work to clients programs I would just have them remove the safety catch you know from the uh the, I guess the connector from the platform so the platforms move independently now they're getting unilateral work at the same time they're getting their volume work and it really made a lot of the workouts more streamlined it either made their workouts shorter or it gave us more opportunity to add in more other components another benefit is since the the foot platforms move independently they don't create as much of a uneven stress through the hip socket. So for example, my mom, uh, one of her hip sockets is slightly rotated compared to the other, uh, like anterior, posterior, kind of like rotation. And that's just, it's been that way for as long as we've known. Uh, we've adjusted for it with powerlifting. She's in her 60s. She squats 275 pounds, deadlifts 330. She's strong as hell. Uh, but to avoid lower back pain, to avoid knee pain, we want to avoid setting her hips up in a position in which that tilt difference causes issues. So getting a unilateral leg press allowed her to alleviate that issue. I broke my leg, uh, one of my legs, my femur, when I was a baby, and one of my legs is an inch and a half longer than the other, and that would always cause me a little bit of issues or a little bit of problems here and there, but the unilateral leg press solves that. So it helps in certain ways for certain conditions, but it also helps with that unilateral component. The new hack squat, for example. We sold the Nebula hack squat. I brought in a Magnum. Now, this is a really old design of Magnum, but damn, is it a good hack squat. <laughs> I had to make some modifications and like uh, cut up some things to get it to work the way I wanted because uh, it had a little bit of abuse on it. But we've sorted that out, and it moves really clean now. It's a more upright hack squat. The angle is much more upright, which requires less weight load for it to feel harder, which actually makes it easier then on your shoulders. So some of the people in the past, like the, with the older style, they're like, man, this kind of digs into your traps, this digs into your shoulders, digs into your neck. This one won't feel that way. Uh, I, for example, broke my collarbone three times in my life, and I have metal plates in my collarbone. One of the metal plates is on the top of the bone. And when I would do things like hack squats before, it would compress down in to where that middle plate is. And I would actually, I remember the one time I did front squats and I was bleeding where the screws were for the middle plate because it had ground into where the skin covers the screws. So I have some gnarly scar tissue there now. Uh, but this was one way for me to alleviate the issue for me in weight load on the shoulders as well as clients and members of the gym it also has a lower platform connection which allows when you combine it with a metal wedge that we have from rogue that you use for like a squat wedge to elevate your heels when you use that on this new low platform you get 
awesome isolative work into the knees, which you can use to just strengthen and develop the knees, like kind of the knees over toes uh, kind of guy that's famous now. Um, you can work on your knees over toes to work on the knees. You can also deload the uh, hack squat with using reverse banding to where you can actually make the weight load a little bit lighter in that most extreme stretch position, but still challenging. So therefore, you get into that extreme stretch with, with a challenging weight load to grow the tissues, but then as you come up out of that main stretch, you get more into a stronger position, the weight load feels heavier as you stand up. So it's actually able to modify the weight load feel based on the curve. There's a strength curve kind of concept where where you feel strongest in a movement, where you feel weakest in a movement, you're able to better match that with this new machine so that way you can get not only safe knee development, but you don't have to sacrifice quad development to try to help the, knee, help the knees or try to go so heavy to get the quads that you annihilate the knees. This is a great way to blend those in. So... It's really awesome to be able to upgrade pieces. It's really awesome to be able to bring in pieces that have um, newer and different benefits than the older pieces offered. And then also what we were able to do is the I just am able to continue to upgrade the equipment to better match my knowledge. So my knowledge as a trainer in the way that I like to train or how I train my clients, I want that to always be an evolving process. I always want to be learning more, you know, improving what I'm doing with people and bringing in new equipment allows me to do that. An example of this was I was working with two clients in the gym and they were working on trying to correct uh, distended stomachs. They both wanted to build bigger backs. One of the machines in the gym that we had at the time was uh, the Nebula angled chest supported row. Really awesome piece. Now that's been copied by Arsenal Strength, so it's not really worth as much anymore. But I was able to sell that for a really good price, really good markup as well. But that piece, due to the angle of it, you had to essentially push your stomach out into the pad to brace the position. So here I have clients that want to build bigger back. Now we had a bunch of other options. There's dumbbell rows, cable seated rows, lat pull downs, like, you know, assisted pull ups. There's a million other things we could do. But I noticed that with that machine, they really had to distend their stomachs to try to hold that bracing position. Now that's just counter to what we would want aesthetically. We don't want to be pushing our stomach out. We want to always have our stomach braced and if anything, we want to kind of be pulling it in and flexing it and tightening it. So that way it's almost creating like a, um, a, a vacuum, a stomach vacuum, which is an, an exercise you use to correct diastasis recti, which is separation of the abdominal wall. So bodybuilders, you'll notice as they get bigger and bigger, their abdominal wall, their, their muscles of their abs or six packs start getting spread further and further apart. Part of that is due to distension in certain exercises. So the angled upright row forced distension. So one of the changes we made was to get a seated upright row. So you got rid of the angle, it's seated. This reduces the need for the abdominal distension. So that's already awesome. You get the same quality of back work, but without the abdominal distension. And the new piece we got offers a position we couldn't do with the other one, which is a sideways one-arm pull, which allows you to hit your lower lats really freaking well. Like the insertion of the lower lats gets annihilated with the new machine. So I was able to upgrade based on you know, things I saw in how people were moving, things I saw in the industry, you know, people getting the distended stomach issues. We want to get rid of distended stomach exercises. So there was a really cool, like, reason in another way uh, why I upgrade and change equipment. The other thing is just, like, client focuses. Like, my mom, and, uh, my mom and dad have helped me a lot. My dad builds a lot of the equipment that we have in our gym. Like, we built a belt squat specifically for a client that could not do leg press. Uh, he had a pacemaker uh, in his back in a position where he couldn't get into the leg press. But he could have a belt for belt squats around his lower back kind of upper glutes. So we actually built a belt squat. <laughs> and this was back in the earlier days of the gym. I definitely could not afford it. I was still paying off loans and things. Uh, so my dad helped me build. We built a belt squat. 
and that was a great way to meet a client's needs. We had another client that had shoulder surgery, shoulder problems, and he couldn't get dumbbells into position. And due to the due to the limitations, he wasn't able to hold one while I handed him the other. The max that we got to were 40 pound dumbbells, and then he started having issues. Well, my dad helped me build dumbbell unracking system. So actually I could throw the dumbbells up on these supports, and then the client would just tilt them forward. He would unrack the dumbbells. They would snap back out of the way. And he was able to go from day one, go from 40s to 70s. That's how much of a difference the limitation of trying to get the dumbbells made for him, get the dumbbells into place. He was able to automatically go from 40-pound dumbbells to 70-pound dumbbells just from that simple change of equipment. So I really love the ability to be able to continue to upgrade the gym. I do understand that certain changes aren't going to be favored by everybody. Not everybody's happy with everything. <laughs> uh, but that's, you know, it's it's sometimes just part of the game is I want to have the gym continue to evolve. Uh, even though it's 12 years old, I don't want it to be where I bought brand new stuff 12 years ago and then I just let it sit here, rust and decay and be abused and it all falls apart and I lose the gym. <laughs> you know, I want this to be a, an ongoing thing, so I have to continue to upgrade it, continue to evolve with uh, the current needs of the collective group. And I hope that I'm being able to do that pretty well. And I really appreciate the support from everybody. I just thought it would be fun to explain in a podcast some of the reasons for the changes that we've been making and why, in general, an owner should and uh, why I change the equipment in the gym. Thought that was fun to share. If you have any other questions or if you just want to shoot the breeze about topics like that, maybe you have a home gym and you're wondering what to upgrade with, just reach out. My email is brutalironjim at gmail.com. I help clients build home gyms all the time. I help other trainers open up uh, training services, training businesses, where we design one-on-one -on -one studios and uh, large commercial gyms. So I love this stuff. It's 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 what I do all day, and I love it. Uh, but if you have any questions, if you need anything, just reach out. My email is brutalironjim at gmail.com. If you like the podcast, please share the podcast. If you like the podcast, please consider donating to support the podcast, which you can do on our website. And if you like the information we share in the podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels. You can find us and follow us on Instagram and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Jim. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.